Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello. I'm just explaining where we are on the yeah. site. So we're standing next to the latrine. <laughs> yes. No toilet jokes. <laughs> no. no. I do have a few toilet jokes, but I'll toilet tell you about them for the moment. We're looking at the West Range, and that was a building put up in 2012. That's allowed us to excavate the whole of this gallery or corridor, which previously was a tarmac path you walked along. Um, and we're looking across the North Range at the North Bathhouse. There are two bathhouses in the villa. The North Range would be a dry heat like a sauna, and the West Range bathhouse, which is here, would be like a Turkish bath, so it's a steam heat. <coughs> uh, and that also houses the winter dining room. Um, and this is a covered corridor, and you can just see the sort of foundations, that double wall just in front of this building. And that would have been this covered corridor, there would have only been one entrance into the upper courtyard. So only VIPs would get through from the lower courtyard into the upper. So you might be congratulating yourself for being a <laughs> VIP <laughs> since we are in the upper courtyard. Unfortunately, being positioned as we are between the latrine and the kitchen, we are probably on the servant end yeah. of the spectrum. So I, I don't wish to <laughs> dispense all your illusions. So what this is, it's an introductory talk. It's about 15 to 20 minutes and it covers what the Romans ever did for us, I suppose. <laughs> when they came, it's very short on dates, so about four, uh, and you can test me on them at the end to see if I still remember them. <laughs> and it tells you why they came here, um, why the villa is here, uh, what a villa is, who might have lived here, and why did it all go wrong at the end. So, uh, but do ask questions. My first tour of the day, I only do it on a Saturday, so I'm always a bit rusty, <laughs> being of advancing years. So, uh, any question you ask probably prompts me to remember what has just gone out of my mind. So, please don't feel backward about coming forward. Um, and I love questions, <laughs> even the ones I can't answer. And I was just saying to a few of you that. A lot of the questions about this site, the answer to is we don't really know. Um, when I've been doing this job for about three weeks, about four years ago, I was told that new site guides could go round with the specialist archaeologist. We got very excited about this and we thought now we will know everything. And we sort of stopped. Our first stop was the latrine and somebody said, well, did men and women use it at the same time? You could we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of set the tone. Why is that? We're not sure. <laughs> Did they? No, I don't know. Um, what is that? We're not sure. So, a lot of, because the Victorians, when they excavated the site, let, left no records of their excavation, didn't plot, plot where anything was found, threw away a lot of the things archaeologists would now find very informative and interesting, put them in spoil heaps around the villa. And I'll tell you what happened to those in a minute when I get to when the Victorians rediscovered it. Uh, but we start with the year 43 AD, which is when the Romans first came and settled in this country. And that, there were about 40,000 Roman soldiers crossed the channel, reluctantly, because Romans didn't like water, in boats. and. They were either opposed by some of the tribes of Britain, because Britain at that time was a tribal country. So uh, some tribes, I'm sure you'll have heard of Boudicca, used to be called Bodicea, which when I went to school, which tells you something about how old I might be. But And the Iceni who did oppose them at some part. Um, but the tribe in this area called the Dubunai did not. And of course, the Romans could not rule their huge empire from North Africa, the Middle East, the, virtually the whole, well, the whole of Western Europe, and finally Britain. They couldn't rule it all from Rome. So what did they do? If they did not meet opposition when they invaded a country or an area, then the people already ruling that area, they aristocratic elite of the tribe, if you like, 
would be appointed as their client rulers. Um, so that's what happened here. They did not oppose it, and therefore the people already in charge of this area, the Dabunai, would have continued to rule it, but under ultimate Roman control, and they would have had to implement Roman laws, collect Roman taxes, um, administer Roman justice, and there would have been a, a, a prefect who oversaw it. Um, so that's what happened here. And in return, the Romans were very pragmatic people. So they you know, allowed the tribe to carry on, keep their own gods. They usually allied them with a Roman god. So if you go to Bath, it's called Aquae Sulis, and that's, or Sulis Minerva were the gods, goddesses. Minerva was the Roman god, and Sulis was a Celtic god. So, you know, they let you get on with your things. And then they built a town close here called Sirencester today, which in Roman times was called Carinium Dobunorum. And the Dabunai, of course, got their name in the title of the town. And the leader of the Dabunai was called Corio. So Carinium is after him. So they throw you a carrot and hide the stick. <laughs> so that's how they managed to rule. So the town of Sirencester, well, Towns were quite a new idea in Britain, really, because before the Romans, they had hill forts and settlements, but nothing we would today call a town. Of course, the Romans had their nice grid system and they set out towns. And if, actually, if you take away all the cities and towns that grew up in the Industrial Revolution, like Manchester and Leeds and um, Sheffield and where am I going? Birmingham, Birmingham Bradford, mm. um, Preston, all these towns. If you look at a map of Roman Britain, it's very similar to our map today. If you, st if you just take out all the industrial centres, you know, we've got Exeter, Chester, Bath, York, Lancaster, Colchester, um, St Albans, <laughs> you go on, London. Um, Sirencester, <coughs> was the second largest town in Roman Britain after London. So a hugely important centre. Uh, we're mm -hmm. getting to the villa. <laughs> so you're, you're wondering what's, what's it got to do with it. Um, because a lot of roads go through Sirencester. They've got the Foss Way, which you might have come out on if you came from that direction, or you came by a North Leach, you'd have come along this straight road the Foss Way, which leads from Exeter to Lincoln, so it's a major cross-country route. And then we've got Ermine Street, Ackerman Street, just over the hill there's a road called the White Way or the Salt Way, which again is a Roman road. So it's, it's sort of like the south-east of England, you know, crisscrossed by motorways. Um, and that's my track here, where are we? Roads, lots of roads and a town. All right, we're getting to the villa now. So first came the forts and the road system, then came the towns, and finally came the villas. And villas mean rural estate or farm in Latin, and that's what they were, and that's what they were for. They were to grow crops and to raise animals. They're nearly all within about 10 miles of a Roman town, because they exist in order to serve that town. And also, they exist in order to uh, supply the Roman army with grain. Because every soldier is entitled to his two loaves of bread a day, and therefore the grain that they need, given that they're b between any one time there's 30,000 to 50,000 soldiers in this country, they need a lot of grain, and there's a levy on every villa to supply a certain amount of, of grain. So that's <coughs> why it's here. and. We come out here along these little windy English roads and you think, why on earth is it here? It's actually in the middle of nowhere. But actually, it's about three miles from the Foss Way. It's two miles from the White Way. And within five miles of this villa, there were nine others that we know of. There may have been more. We're always discovering one. I think there was one discovered in Wiltshire, a very large one on a farm 
quite recently. So there are probably others that have yet to be discovered. Um, so it's really like the home counties. It's got a huge network of roads and it's very well populated. It's very peaceful. It's good farming <coughs> land. It's a prosperous part of Britain. And the first villa on this site, when it was three small separate buildings, uh, between about 125 and 150 AD. So nearly a hundred years after the Romans first settled the country. Um, it might have been 8,000 acres. Um, though when we're talking about um, this being a farm, it's not like the Archers and Eddie Grundy, if anybody listens to it. It's more like if you watch it, Downton Abbey. So it's the sort of Downton Abbey, this building, or the Blenheim, or the Chatsworth of the Roman world, because this is a very, very um, expensive building here. So we know that you had to have a lot of money, and the people who actually inhabited this villa itself would not have got their hands dirty in any way. They would have had farm managers, they would have had a lot of workers who would have been doing the agricultural work. Uh, they would have been the aristocratic owners of the villa. And they were probably what we call Romano-British rather than Romans. So uh, children come and think, you know, Romans, fiats, pasta, you know, all these things they associate. But these were probably originally Britons and over the centuries of Roman occupation, they become completely Romanized. So they see what the Romans have, flushing toilets, underfloor heating, mosaics, lots of people to tend your every need. And they think this is quite a good thing to do. Um, and so when you look at the mosaics, they are um, classical mosaics. Then you don't get any sense sense of the Celts, the Celtic Britons who became Romanized. Uh, they bought into it, if you like, because it's nearly 400 years of occupation. If we look back 400 years from now, we're back in what, Civil War time, somewhere <coughs> like that, and think how much has changed over those centuries. And so it's difficult because you sort of think of the Romans as a fixed point in time, but it covers an awfully long time in British history. Right, so it's here because it's near the Fossway, the White Way, Sirencester or Roman Corinium, and also because of this, and that's water. There's a spring, and even better, it's on a slope. So it can be delivered, delivered by gravity to the areas of the villa, like the latrine, like the bathhouses. So it's an ideal spot as well as being beautiful, um, everything in its favour. So that's why they settled here. Uh, there was an Iron Age settlement before the Romans were here for the same reason, because of the spring. So what's that cupboard? What is it? Why is it here? <coughs> Who lived here? We <coughs> Unfortunately, we have no names. There are no written records. So we can only guess. It may well have just been a country estate for someone who had a townhouse in Sirencester and who was very, would have been very important and therefore very wealthy. So wealth and status went hand in hand in the Roman world. So they would have been wealthy and they would have, how do you know that? from the size of the villa and the number and the quality of the mosaics. It would have cost a fortune. Uh, and it's very, very tantalising that we, you know, I'm rather um, sad that we don't know anything about the people who lived here. Um, the only clue we had was a silver spoon with the name Sensorinas engraved on it. Uh, well, we have a record of that. Somebody wrote about it a long time ago. But at some stage, that vanished. So, if anybody has that, <laughs> I think it might be worth quite a bit of money. So, search your silver spoon collection. But that's all. And we'll, 
we have no records of the censorings. We have very, very few records because Britain was not of great interest to the people who wrote at that time. So the Romans, you know, Seneca, Virgil, all the other people who wrote, were not interested in Britain. This tiny dot on the map, northwest corner of the empire, didn't have huge interest for them. So they wrote very little about it. Um, right. Okay. So. They arrive in 43 AD. The golden age of Roman Britain was about three tw between 320 and 380 AD. And that's when this really prospered. So they, they went in for home improvements in a big way, particularly between those dates. So they joined up the separate buildings. They installed underfloor heating. They improved the bathhouse. They did an awful lot of um, home improvements. But even at that time, the Roman Empire was disintegrating. Um, it had been falling apart, really, from the second century. And it continued to decline elsewhere, even although at that time Britain was a very prosperous and happy part of the empire, if you like. But it's like all empires. And we seem to get an echo of history from this. <laughs> People start thinking to themselves, why are we doing what the Romans tell us to do? Who elected the Romans? We didn't. Uh, why are we paying our taxes to Rome? We could keep them and then we could make our own laws and do what we want and we wouldn't be paying. What have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> so, I am taking no sides in this. <laughs> I do have a side, but I'm being neutral. <laughs> but it's what happens, and it's what happened throughout the Roman Empire. So tribes started to rebel. There were rebellions. Uh, and also, they got a lot more clever and savvy during the years of Roman occupation. They'd seen how the Romans fought. They had worked out what... Vienna was in decline towards the end of his existence. And we know that because of the recent archaeology we've done on the site, especially on the North Bath House. Because originally, when they first built the villa, there, was, there were baths on the, the ground floor, so there was no underfloor heating. And then, between 320 and 380, they installed the hyper course, the underflower, <coughs> underflower, <laughs> underfloor <laughs> heating system with a mosaic floor on top. So it, it was at its you know, most successful. And then towards the end of its history, they filled in the hype, of course, with rubble. And their rubble were bits of painted wall plaster, chunks of mosaic floor, and they just filled up the gaps between the pillars with rubble, and they put a very rough, what's called opus signinum floor on top. So it's declined. They don't have the money or the staff to keep on with the underfloor heating um, because you would have needed an awful lot of labour in order to continue that system. And then we presume they withdrew to their townhouse in Sirencester if that's what they had because they stripped the villa, we think, of everything of value. So it wasn't that it was attacked and destroyed, it was that they decided not to come out here anymore because there was a collapse uh, and it's always it, the economy isn't it really that leads to the collapse and there was hyperinflation there was no coinage brought in from Rome of course the farms are to supply the army they've got no army to supply there's also a, people are leaving Sirencester because they are dependent upon the army and the Roman administration the administration itself starts to fall apart. Nobody's administering the laws. Nobody's punishing wrongdoers. So the whole system breaks down. You can't sell what you grow on your farm. So you, you, if you can't sell it, you can't pay your servants. Your servants going to, aren't going to work for nothing. And one of the few records we have is of bands of servants roaming the countryside, taking what they can. So it becomes a less safe place and also the soldiers are the ones who maintain the roads so once the soldiers leave who is going to 
maintain the roads. Mm. And even in our you know, very advanced, civilised country, you see what a couple of hard winters do to our roads. So you imagine what some hard winters would do to the Roman roads. So all in all, the villas are abandoned. And then what happens to them? They're used for agricultural storage. We've got um, evidence of fires that were lit on the mosaic floors, evidence of grain storage. There was a millstone found in one room. So it's used for agricultural, for agricultural purposes. And of course, nobody bothers to maintain it. So once the roofs start to, you know, the tiles come off, nobody uh, repairs it. And over the centuries, it becomes covered and wooded like the area around it and it's only in um, 1864 that the Victorians rediscover the site and how do they rediscover it well this is the story um, the Thomas Margetts the gamekeeper on the local store <coughs> park estate goes out after rabbits with his ferret uh, and you pop the ferret down the rabbit hole to flush them out into your nets. And so he pops his ferret down, waits for the rabbits to come out, and nothing happens. So no rabbits, no sign of his ferret. <laughs> well, he doesn't want to lose his ferret, so he gets his spade and starts to dig. And on his spade come out bits of stone like these these square pieces of stone that are called tesserae and that go to make up a mosaic floor where well, he thought, well, these are strange things to find down a rabbit hole. I'll show them to the owner of the estate. So the owner of the estate was called Lord Eldon. He was only 19, so he had a, a guardian. Uh, his uncle, James Farrer, who was an MP, but also a very keen amateur archaeologist. And as soon as he saw these, he knew there must be a villa on the site. So in the summer of 1864, they excavated it. Although if you watch Time Team, it wasn't a bit like it. <laughs> Get 50 state workers with shovels and picks, <laughs> and they're told to keep digging down until you get down to uh, mosaics, and that's what they did. Uh, and what they found was mostly foundations and a lot of stone. So what you see mostly, especially in the open areas, are Roman foundations with Victorian walls built up using the stone they found on the site. Mostly on the correct foundations, not always. And then they did a few peculiar things, because if you look, that's the last of the Victorian huts, straight across the north, um, the um, upper courtyard, and if you look just below roof level, can you see a bit of stone that juts out? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the base of a Roman column turned upside down and inserted near the top of that Victorian <laughs> wall. And there's one on the other side as well. So they did a few things that archaeologists would probably not be too happy with no. these days. But they did preserve <coughs> them the mosaics by putting up huts to protect them throughout the winter. So they did some good things and some bad things from our point of perspective today. Um, right. I'm sure there's something else I meant to say at this point. <laughs> Anybody got any questions while I, I'm trying and um, walking to Um well, I'll tell you what you can see. So the, the best mosaics are in the dining room, winter dining room, and this bathhouse. Um, the one in the dining room is particularly fine, and if you look at the size of the tesserae, they're about a third of the size of the smallest one I have here. There are, I can't remember the number now, I shall have to look it up again. There are something like 300,000 individual tesserae in that design. Is that all local stone? It's all local stone. It's creamy is local limestone, the bluey grey is called liassic limestone or blue lias and that's probably from Somerset and then you can get deep red which is sandstone from the Forest of Dean or mostly it's orangey and that's terracotta because they made terracotta bricks and tiles and pots 
And if you broke one, it's a waste not want not society. You wasted nothing. If you wanted to know what they did with their urine, <laughs> they washed it. They washed cloth in it. So although we have a latrine, they would probably have had pots positioned around the villa uh, because it was a valuable commodity. You could bleach linen with it. It was used to fix dyes when you dyed cloth. And it was used to in leather production as well. So why waste it? Have it flushed away. So they probably flushed the other lot away. I won't go into that. But urine would probably have been stored at two weeks, I think, for the ammonia to, to really uh, have developed so you can clean your clothes with it. Well, Victorians still used it for cleansing. So, um, and, of course, if these broke, you cut them up for tesserae. And then the bits that were left, the shards or the tiny pieces, you mix with lime mortar to make something called opus signinum like the floor that was on in that bathhouse and you'll see that in the bathhouse areas it's a very pinky color because of the, the terracotta mixed in with the lime water and it makes it more waterproof because it's got the brick in it so look for that in the in the um the uh, bathhouse areas um the spring certainly have a look at gaia you can just see her is in the north range bathhouse and she's an expert on Roman um, textiles. So she's got Roman knitting and Roman, she dyes her own wools, so she can tell you all about the use of urine if you want to <laughs> know any more <laughs> in fixing dyes. Um, the museum is that building with the little round window. Uh, there's not a huge number of artifacts. Oh, because I forgot to tell you, I know what I forgot to tell you. <coughs> I do apologize. Right, when they excavated the villa, they put the soil they excavated in spoil heaps around the villa. One of them was in the centre, just in front of this opening. And when Lord Eldon fell out with James Farrer, his uncle Lord Eldon built his shooting lodge there. So that's a mock Tudor Victorian <laughs> shooting lodge. So I knew there was something. <laughs> it's just come back to me when I mentioned the museum. So there's a museum. Do taste the spring water that the Romans tasted, there's a jug of it in the cafe, um, and enjoy your visit, hopefully, and um, if you've got any questions, do ask. Thank you. Thank you very well. Thank you.